Science Uncut, presented by the Volkswagen Foundation. Everyone everywhere nowadays collects data, be it text, audio or images. But collecting is one thing. What these masses of data are good for is a completely different question. What can we actually do with big data? This is the central question of Victor Meyer Schönberger's talk. Maya Schönberger is Professor for Internet Governance and Regulation at the Internet Institute at Oxford University. The title of his talk is The Big Deal About Big Data. Maya Schönberger uses examples to show the possibilities big data offer. For example, flu pandemics. Nowadays, because of Google, we can monitor the spread of pandemics in real time. But big data not only changes what we can know, it doesn't simply add new knowledge. Big data also changes the way we do research. Indeed, it sometimes even changes the rules of how to conduct good research. Take Google Translate. Today, putting a foreign language text into Google Translate leads to quite acceptable results. We get these good results because Google's algorithm relies on quantity, not quality. Sounds wrong? Not in this case. Because Google Translate uses all the data it can get, no matter how good or bad they are, it yields high quality results. Using only good quality data, but less, would actually produce significantly worse translations. Victor Meyer Schönberger gave his talk on December 5, 2013 at the Herrenhäuser Conference of the Volkswagen Foundation in Hannover, Germany. The conference had the title Digital Humanities Revisited – Challenges and Opportunities in the Digital Age. I'll start with a story. The story has to do with the flu. Every year the winter flu kills tens of thousands of people around the world. But in 2009, a new flu virus was discovered, the H1N1 virus. And experts at that time feared that it might kill tens of millions of people. No vaccine was available, so the best that health authorities around the world could do was to spread the virus's spread, um, to slow the virus's spread. But in order to do that, they didn't need to know where the virus actually was. And so the Centers for Disease Control in the United States requested from doctors all around the country to send them information about each and every flu case that they got. That was useful, but collecting and analyzing that information takes time. So the CDC's picture into the flu pandemic was always about a week or two late, which is an eternity when you have a pandemic underway. At around the same time, engineers at a little company called Google had an alternative idea on how to predict the spread of the flu. Their idea focused on searches. That is on the search terms that users of the Google search engine send to Google every single day. It's about three billion of them, and Google saves all of them, in fact, has saved all of them since its inception. Now, the idea was to take the 50 million most frequently searched search terms were and when Americans searched for them and compared them to historical flu data dating back five years. And after crunching 500 million mathematical models, the Google engineer identi engineers identified a model of 45 search terms that when taken together could predict the spread of the flu with high accuracy. In fact, when you look at the official CDC data and the prediction of Google, you see a surprising overlap. But while the Centers for Disease Control data was always about a week or two late, Google can do its flu predictions in real time. Now, this is at the core of what big data is all about. It is 
gaining insights from vast amounts of data points that would not have been possible with a smaller set of data points. So it's understandable that we look at this and say, oh, this is about the absolute size of data. We heard a little bit, Jeff did that, uh, and this is an overview of the data avalanche uh, that uh, we are experiencing. Uh, over the last 25 years, the amount of data stored in the world, gathered and stored, has been increasing uh, by leaps and bounds. In 1987, we had about 2.6 billion gigabytes of data in the world. 20 years later, we had about 300 billion gigabytes. Now, if you go back in human history to sort of similar avalanches, similar increases in data and data availability, uh, then you have to go back uh, relatively far. Elizabeth Eisenstein maintains that from 1450 to 1503, the number of, basically the number of books in the world after the Gutenberg Revolution doubled. Uh, so it's a 2x increase in 50 years. We have a 100x increase in 20 years. That's uh, quite remarkable. But this is only half of the story. The other half of the story, of course, is what kind or type of information we store. If you look at the pink color, that's analog. The purple color, it's digital information. By the year 2000, which is that uh, vertical white line there, by the year 2000, three quarters of information around the world was still analog. I remember the year 2000. That was not too long ago. Well, that might actually be a uh, case of my age rather than a case of how close it has been. So from the year 2000 with three quarters analog to 2013, 13 years later, today it's only 1% analog in the world anymore. 99% is digital. And that means that this increase in quantity of data that we have available can lead to a new quality, much like if you take a photograph, it's a photograph. If you take a photograph every 10 seconds of a horse, it's still just a photograph of a horse. But if you take 15 photographs a second and show them fast, then in fact, you do have something else called a movie. In a way, we are witnessing what we suggest in the book are three fundamental shifts or qualities that big data uh, may bring with it. Uh, that we haven't had available to us easily in the small data age. So what are they? More, messy, and correlations. Let me talk about first more. More means that we have more data points available relative to the phenomenon or the question that we want to study or answer compared with the small random samples that we used so far. So it's not the absolute data points that count. If I have 60,000 data points that cover an entire phenomenon, then that is N equals all or N uh, approaches all, and that is big data. How can, we, how can we understand what that means? Because if you have something that approaches N equals all, you can actually let the data speak and gain insights into details that otherwise you couldn't get. One way of looking at it is, again, to use photography. Now, when we take a photo, I have to decide what I'm focusing on. So if I want to focus on you in the second row, and I'll focus on you, then you are in focus, but you in the background, sorry, are going to be out of focus. And that means at the moment of gathering the information, I have to decide what kind of details I capture and what kind of details I'm not capturing. So afterwards, after I've taken a photo, I can't go back and put you back in focus there because your data isn't there. Now, suppose you could do that. Right? The truth is, you can, at least to an extent. This is a photograph that I have taken of my toothbrush. In the background, there's my three-year-old son. He is out of focus. This is a light field camera goes by the commercial name of Lytro, but what it does is it takes all or close to all of the light rays in and captures it. So therefore, I can, after I've taken the photo, and this is a light field photo, choose what I want to focus on. If I click on my son, he comes into focus. 
If I click on my toothbrush, that comes into focus. That is, after I collected the data, I can, as I analyze it, as I look at it, as I come up with questions, ask the data what it can do. This is similar to what you can do with big data. If you have all of the data, you can drill into details. You can look into and ask questions about it that you didn't know when you collected the data. That's more. How about messy? Messy means that we can give up a little bit on our desire for exactitude as we collect much more data. It's obvious to an extent. If I only have 10 data points and three of them are a miss, I'm in deep trouble. Uh, statisticians sometimes call that gigo, garbage in, garbage out. But if I have 4 billion data points and only 1,000 of them are a miss, then that is less of a problem doesn't mean that we give up on exactitude altogether. It means that if we need to think of where we spend limited resources, it might be better not to spend them on improving the quality of the data collection, but increasing the quantity of the data collection. The third one, and one that is very hard for us humans to do, is to think about the relationship between correlations and causality. As human beings in general, and as scientists in particular, we want to know the causes of things. Because we see the world as a, through a lens of causes and effects. It's comforting. Uh, it gives us a sense that we have an understanding of the underlying functioning of the world around us. But quite frankly, a lot of times, it's just not true. If I have dinner here in Hanover, and tomorrow I have a stomach bug, then I think immediately, it is because what I ate in Hanover. The truth is, statistically speaking, it's much more likely that I got the stomach bug by shaking hands with any one of you than having dinner in that restaurant. Oftentimes, when we think we have identified causes, we really haven't. And so we may need to be a little more humble in what we think we can achieve. And that humility means that we should, rather than thinking we can identify and tease out the why, settle to identify what is going on. And for that, correlations, that is, seeing connections in the data set can actually help. Let me give you an example, um, an actual big data example. It has to do with machine translation. Now, in the 1950s, the U.S. Pentagon uh, spent a lot of money trying to get software written that could translate Russian into English. Uh, at that time, the NSA didn't exist in its current form, but they still already collected a lot of information and didn't have enough, enough interpreters to, or translators to translate it over into English. So the idea was to use computers. And the software engineers that they asked said, oh, this is very easy. We have 200 grammatical rules. Uh, we have a dictionary. And within a couple of months, we're done. By 1962, they had to concede defeat. The Pentagon wrote off about a billion dollars. Not the first time, not the last time that they did that. Um, and everybody moved on. Uh, fast forward to the 1980s. Then IBM had an idea. And the idea was that rather than teaching a computer why one word in one language needs to be translated in another word in another language, it's perfectly sufficient to just go for the what. That is for a statistical inference, a statistical correlation of what word in one language is most frequently translated into what word in another language in a given context. So all that you need to do for that is to have a lot of training data. And they thought they had by going to the official transcripts of the Canadian Parliament that were available in both English and French. And so they trained their, uh, their system with four million nicely translated sentences uh, of that Canadian Parliament transcripts. And to their surprise and delight, Project Candide, that's what it was called, worked flawlessly. It worked better than they had hoped for. We had the first workable machine translation system. And then IBM said, ah, 
ah, now we know what we need to do. We need to improve the algorithm, improve the model. That did not improve the outcome very much. So they gave up. Fifteen years later, Franz Ox at a a small startup company in the Silicon Valley called Google had another idea. And that idea was to feed the entire internet into the system. You know, the European Union websites in multiple languages, uh, but also company websites, uh, Google Book Scan um, from in multiple um, books in multiple language versions that have been scanned through Google Book Scan, but also all of these manuals that you can download from routers and ironing boards and washing machines online. Can you imagine how crazy that is? If I look at my manual for my video recorder, I cannot understand the German that it tells me, um, but they fed all of that in. And that drives Google Translate. And it is an order of magnitude better than IBM's project Candide. Why? Because more data, even if it is messy data, trumps less data, even if it is less messy. And the algorithm that they used was actually extremely primitive because the knowledge was in the data. That is a big data application because it uses much more data, it uses messy data, and it's purely based on correlations. In a way, what we need to do as scientists that are trained in the small data age, I am a social scientist, right? I'm a recovering lawyer, but I'm a real a social scientist. So I'm a social scientist, and I am steeped, I was trained in the small data universe. My entire thinking, the institutions, the process in which I operate are small data. And now I need to think differently. I need to step out of my comfort zone and out of the paradigm. Because in the small data age, we defined the purpose from the outset. We had a concrete hypothesis to run. We gain insight from the least amount of data and emphasize data quality. And we also imply a lot of times causal connections. Essentially, small data confirms the known. Well, in the big data context, we, we hope that we can let the data speak, embrace the messiness, and rely on correlations. The idea is to uncover the novel rather than confirm the hypothesis. Uh, let me tell you very briefly that after we had the book out and we had this Google flu trend story in there, a scientist from Canada called me up and said, I had that idea about predicting the flu earlier than you. I even wrote it in an article. I want you to correct your book. So I read the article. I'm a good scientist. I like to be corrected because that means that people read my stuff. Uh, and, And this is what he did. He came up with the three terms that he thought could predict the spread of the flu through search terms. He did a correlation analysis. He found a correlation. He said, confirmed. What is what Google did? Google didn't know and didn't hypothesize about a particular search term or a combination of search terms. They tested all 50 million of them. They, in fact, tested 500 million different models to find not just one for which a correlation could be found, but the best one. They algorithmically created hypotheses and thereby uncovered the novel rather than confirmed the existing. Now, as I'm trying to conclude here, this was the overview of big data and what it can do. Let me venture into guesses about three trends that we might see with respect to big data. First, of course, is that with big data, social sciences are going to be reborn. It's a different kind of paradigm, a paradigm that is less connected in the empirical world to surveys and artificialized experiments the generations of generations of sophomores that have been subjected to trials and experiments in colleges in order to tease out social science theories will be replaced, hopefully, by something more data robust. Second is that the social sciences, that is the social element of sciences, will spill over into the humanities and the natural sciences. We already see it in many instances where humanities turn into something much more social science-like. But the natural sciences, too, as uh, medicine now becomes something much more social. That is, we're not looking at the bodily biological functions. We're looking at much beyond that, 
as the people at the Institute of Systems Biology, for example, in Seattle do. And thirdly, of course, we are, and I alluded to that already, reinventing or reshaping the scientific method. It used to be theory, hypothesis, test. That's going to be gone as we can replace, reshape the hypothesis part. Now, let me, let me tell you that here with the Google flu uh, trends example, when they did that, they let the data speak. Whenever there is new data available, they recalculate it. It's a Bayesian model of the world rather than a Boolean model of the world. Uh, and that also makes them harness their model and improve their model as uh, faults in the model or faults in the data are being discovered like last year in December. The theory isn't dead, but conjuring up hypothesis manually, maybe, at least in some circumstances. So I talked about three shifts and I talked about three trends. And the core message is that with big data, science is going to be transformed. Thank you.